Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Aparuta de Sangamata Satawara e Sodawanta Bamunchantu Satang. So, this is a special event of remembering the teacher Tanajan Cha, Tanjau Kun. Pojinyana Terra. <coughs> it uh, would be his 90th birthday today, 17th of June. So usually at this time I'm not here, and then we have another celebration uh, on when he died and uh, on the 16th of January. That's usually, I go to Thailand for that. Because <coughs> that's when m- many uh, big meeting and uh, uh, a retreat, meditation retreat event at uh, Wat Ban Ong Pa Pong Ajahn Chah's monastery. So this is, this is his birthday. And he, he, of course, always thought celebrating birthdays was a bit of a joke. <laughs> and because in Thailand, I think they have a different attitude, especially his generation. Um, but they still, people like to celebrate birthdays. <coughs> and also it gives one a chance to reflect on a great teacher uh, that w- was alive. Uh, uh, some of us actually knew him very well. I think Ajahn Chandasiri met him and uh, myself. Ajahn Yanarato Panyasaro. So it was... Uh, he was the kind of inspiration for uh, these uh, monasteries in, in England, in Europe, in Australia, in New Zealand, and in America. <coughs> and it's quite an quite a interesting uh, thing to contemplate. Uh, a, a Thai monk in northeast uh, Thailand um, who had... Um, it's relatively unknown when I first went to live in Thailand in 1966. Uh, uh, I spent the first six months in Bangkok where uh, I was trying to find a teacher uh, or a place to ordain. And uh, of course, nobody then amongst the ex- expatriate or European Buddhist community living in Bangkok at that time, nobody had ever mentioned Ajahn Shah. And Ubon is where he lived, which is uh, the province that, that borders on both Laos and Cambodia. And so it was, uh, there was a huge uh, American military base there at the time, an airfield. Uh, and this was during the Vietnam War. So there, were, uh, there was a big uh, B-52 airfield, or these huge monstrous planes that would go take off from Ubon and fly over and bomb uh, Hanoi. We could even hear them sometimes taking off from the monastery. Uh, where we could hear from the monastery that they made so much noise. And this, uh, I was the first Western monk there. So it was quite, uh, you know, for the local people, it was quite a surprise because they were used to Americans, American airmen. Uh, riding around on motorcycles and uh, 
so forth, but uh, for an American to become a Buddhist monk at Wat Ban Ong Pong, which was considered the, the one of the most strict and disciplined and toughest monasteries in all of Thailand. And they couldn't see why I was, uh, would even think of ordaining there. In fact, some, some people told me that three months in the Thai, Thai tradition usually a man's supposed to ordain uh, during his lifetime at least for three months during the Vasa or the rainy season retreat. And some people told me that spending one Vasa retreat at Wat Bapong was worth 10 years of being a monk at any other monastery. <laughs> My, the thing that impressed me, of course, was the, the teacher himself, Lung Po Cha, and that it was a disciplined, uh, a disciplined place. Uh, in Thailand, of course, being a Buddhist country, uh, for hundreds of years, it has the wide range of from the from the best to the worst, and so a lot of the like uh, in Bangkok, I I would never have really wanted to to uh, become a monk if I had to live in the monasteries in Bangkok, and so I I looked uh, my ideal were these forest monasteries, and by circumstances or by fate, destiny or whatever, I <coughs> eventually found uh, uh, Lung Po Cha. And it was a strange event because he wasn't known uh, even in Bangkok. He was becoming quite well known in the uh, northeast Thailand, in the Ethan. But uh, as far as even Thai people that I knew in Bangkok, they didn't, they'd never heard of him. So, um, by circumstances, I met one of his disciples, who, a Thai monk who spoke uh, English, and at that time, I couldn't speak Thai. So, this monk and I, he convinced me to, to go and spend my first Vasa as a bhikkhu with Lung Po Cha. I had the insight during the first year when I was a Samanera. Uh, I wasn't with Lung Po Cha, I was living in Nong Kai. And I had the insight there that I needed, I needed to learn how to submit, to surrender, to obey. And this is, uh, this, I had this very strong insight. If I was going to become a bhikkhu, I needed to not just be a kind of perfunctory bhikkhu or just get by. I needed to learn how I learned how to be under somebody and and uh, live in some kind of discipline that I had no say in the matter. It was, it was beyond my control. And so Wat Bapong offered this opportunity because a very traditional <coughs> uh, Thai forest monastery with uh, uh, very strict on the, on the Vinaya discipline. Well, this Vinay discipline is not an easy one for an American from California <laughs> because uh, this is not uh, what we expect from life. We expect that Americans have this very strong sense, I think even more so than the British, a sense of self-assertion, independence, not being dependent on anybody, uh, proving yourself. So there's very much this strong sense of me uh, in, in my cultural conditioning, the importance of me in my life and what I think and what I want. And I could see that that would be uh, an obstruction in the, when I was, even before I met Ajahn Chah, there was too much of me in everything I did, even when I was living alone. And so I, I had this insight uh, that I would f try to find uh, a very strict Vinaya monastery, which I, through circumstances, found through meeting this uh, disciple of Ajahn Chah. So when I went to Wat Bapong, I, uh, 
I immediately kind of felt uh, that this is what I was looking for. It was uh, an intuitive sense of this. I'd been to many other monasteries, but never felt so strongly, so strongly about staying at them. I never met, I met most of the well-known teachers in Thailand, my monastic teachers, uh, and I was very much impressed with them, but I never felt any great affinity to where I wanted to kind of train under them or live with them. <clears throat> and, but I did with Ajahn Chah. So, uh, the chemistry was right or, or the karma or whatever way you want to explain it. I, uh, once I found this, this monastery, I didn't really look any further. I, I decided to stay there as long as I could. Uh, so I was there, in, or in the various branches, for ten years before coming here to England. Now the first year, when I first went there, I couldn't speak any Thai whatsoever. And then in the Isan, they, they spoke a Lao dialect. Uh, so there was this, this problem with uh, language. And so many people, both Thai and uh, English asked me, how could I possibly learn anything if, uh, if, I was, if there was no language, uh, common language? Is there a fire? <laughs> So this is an interesting one because my, uh, I find that meditation for me is, a, is really learning to trust an intuitive sense. Uh, during the, the year that I was a Samanera, as many of you have heard me talk about it before, I had a tremendous insight into the Four Noble Truths. And, so, and this was uh, not just a kind of intellectual exercise, but uh, insight is the kind of gut knowledge, a profound and uh, direct understanding of Dhamma. So I did have, have this before I met Ajahn Chah, but also part of that insight was I needed, if I was going to take the higher ordination of the bhikkhu, I needed to actually uh, do it in a proper way, not just in a, in a kind of traditional way. And being a, not being Thai, I of course had a very American attitude, a Western attitude about religion and monasticism. I didn't really understand it. Uh, the, the Thai culture I didn't really understand. Um, but I was open. And so a lot that I learned both when I was living alone in the uh, Wat Nun Panau and Nong Kai, uh, and when I went to live with Lung Po Cha in Uborn was basically using an intuitive sense in which uh, is, is outside the particular necessity of a common language. Because the first year I, I learned to speak the language, but uh, like any of you know that when you're living in a, in a country whose language you don't know, it takes a while. To, to and Thai is a very different kind of language than English or languages that I had studied, French or whatever, in, in, uh, when I lived in, when I was in university. So this, um, I had to learn how to, to com receive a different kind of way of talking, a tonal, where tones and vowels become uh, the necessity and where you have to listen uh, in, to, to understand the, the tone of the word, uh, which in English, of course, is not really part of our way of speaking. The, the tone doesn't define the word, where in Thai, the, the tone that you give <coughs> is, um, it could, the word could have many different meanings with different tones. So this was learning to tune in to the uh, environment, to the teacher, to the uh, situation I was in. 
one thing I did appreciate was uh, uh, that I felt this was uh, a very admirable monastery and the uh, ambience was one of, of, of practice. Ajahn Chah's main emphasis was on the practice of Dhamma. So he told me in the beginning, he said to put away your books, you don't bother to read anything, just practice. And of course, my, myself being one who loves books, I became addicted to reading books. When I was a layman, I couldn't go anywhere without a book. I felt very ill at ease. Uh, so I always had, had a book with me. Uh, and of course, I gave up books and, <laughs> and uh, lived, uh, I couldn't have a, 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 I had to learn the, the language. But also, I learned, I realized that what I d had to do was follow, conform, and uh, that conformity was not a, a value that, that I ever had. In fact, when I was uh, in the university, I saw myself as a nonconformist. I prided myself as being a nonconformist, and that conformity was for idiots. So there's the kind of conceit I had uh, when I was a young, young man. And I'd been in the military where you had to conform, and that was enough, you know, four years of the U.S. Navy was enough for that. And then the, the, the kind of expressing yourself and living your life and self-assertion and, and proving yourself and, and also nonconformity uh, appealed to me, a sense of freedom to do whatever I felt like doing. Then uh, finding myself in this monastery where they, they was, the only way I could stay there was by conforming. There were no kind of agreements or negotiations about, you know, I'll, I don't particularly want to do this or that. You just did whatever, you know, and then I was a, a newly ordained bhikkhu when I went there. Ajahn Chah was, uh, you know, wouldn't give me any special privileges either because, you know, many people felt that being a, a Western monk, uh, I'd have trouble with the food and, uh, and of course everything was new for me. The, the type of food and the climate was hot and um, the customs, the language, everything was was different than what I was accustomed to uh, as a lay person. So uh, it did demand a kind of conformity, a blind conformity. But within that conformity, uh, Lung Po Cha was not, it, was not, it wasn't like a concentration camp or the military, it was, there was a purpose to it. The conformity was was the way that we agreed to live together for mindfulness. So Ajahn Chah's emphasis was always on cultivating awareness and mindfulness. Well, of course, this is the, uh, the, the as, as you know, is the essence, is the essential. And when I chant, the gate to the deathless is open, the, the gate is actually mindfulness. It's our ability to awaken to be fully present and receptive in the in the here and now moment so then the conditions whatever whatever they might be are no longer the essence or the the thing that one is is uh, seeking to c control and manipulate the condition realm but the uh, the agreement to live within the structure of the discipline in order for mindfulness, not for blind conformity or just be, being a kind of puppet or a, a toy soldier marching in step. Uh, and that's, of course, how, how I viewed it at first, was just you had, you know, this kind of conformity was, um, seemed not that much different from naval training. But in naval training, it was all about uh, reward and punishment about uh, you know you were you were be, you were conforming uh out of fear out of 
uh, you know, you would be ostracized, punished, or but for not conforming and humiliated, especially in the uh, preliminary training for the for the military. But this was, of course, uh, I chose to be in this monastery. I could have left at any time, and then then the, there was a highly high sense of moral commitment. The uh, there was. Uh, this training in in morality and in renunciation i was i knew i needed that i needed to have boundaries for behavior boundaries that that i had no uh right or ability to change according to my my own wishes so it, this is this is why i emphasize it what is a tradition is it is it's a package thing you get to conform to in order to watch and observe your the way uh, you know the res restraint the the grasping the rebellion whatever emotions arise within these conditions Lung Po Cha was uh, was he was really uh, he was a very wise human being and this I felt right from the beginning that this was you know he uh, he kind of was like the kind of person I would like to be uh, I'd never really uh, met a, a wise person before or lived with one for very long I met wise teachers but as I said before I didn't have any great interest in living with them but living with Lung Po Cha was uh, the more I began to to tune in to him on this intuitive level. Uh, I realized that he could have wisdom, compassion, were very much uh, uh, a part of the life. So it wasn't just uh, like a learning to march in step and do everything mechanically, but to learn how to to simplify one's life to where we could actually live together and and develop awareness, mindfulness. Now most of us, most people, you know, are mindful to a certain degree, but it's not a value of our society. Uh, I don't ev even remember uh, using the word mindfulness uh, before I became a monk. Um, when, when I became a, a monk, started meditating, uh, the emphasis was on concentration. It was all about samadhi. And of course I'd read many books on samadhi and on yoga and, and Vedanta and whatnot. So, so this, this word samadhi, uh, me, you know, was like a, created this, this sense of something you attain, you've got to get, you've got to get samadhi. And that's very much how <coughs> the Western monks or Western Buddhists in Bangkok talked as getting, attaining, samadhi. So, you know, I, I had this same mindset of getting and attaining these, these states of concentration. Uh, and what Lung Po Cha was challenging that, this attaining mind, because it was about receptivity and awakening in the present uh, not as an attainment but as letting go the whole emphasis was on letting go of desire for attaining uh, so that was quite uh, quite a revelation to to realize you know the, the, the motivation was to become to get samadhi or get states higher states of consciousness to to get something I didn't have uh, yet and or to get rid of the the negativity the defilements the kilesas uh, the faults uh, the weaknesses that I have is to get rid of them get rid of the bad and try to get hold of the good and so the this is this was how my thinking mind my personality operated was very much in, on, on that level of attaining 
and getting rid of, was annihilating, getting, destroying defilements, chalazes, and attaining uh, high levels of consciousness. So then this, of course, Lumpo Cha would could challenge uh, just by pointing to, to, you know, he, he was able to get me to look at what I was actually doing and what I was thi thinking and what uh, my own emotional reactions to the, to the restraint, to the frustration uh, of training as a Buddhist monk, learning a, another language, getting used to a, a different type of diet, uh, learning to conform, obey, follow, know your place within the structure. Uh, this was all uh, something that brought up a lot of resistance, uh, conceit, pride, and rebelliousness. But rather than, than you know, the important thing was be the seeing the suffering caused from attaching to these reactions. So intuitively, I, I kind of n understood this. The reason why I, I went and put myself into such a situation was during that year in Nong Kai, I did have that kind of insight. But the, the momentum of my karma was very much based on attaining and achieving, getting rid of, purifying, which meant to me, uh, from the ego level, to purify was to get rid of, uh, to annihilate, kill the defilement, uh, you know, the axis of evil, the uh, terrorists, the punish the criminals, uh, behead the, 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 uh, the heretics, and so forth. Uh, even though on, a, on an intellectual level I didn't, didn't like that, yet actually emotionally I was very much conditioned toward this achieving, attaining, uh, by getting rid of and suppressing. Now like, uh, mindfulness then is not, is not like suppressing, denying, uh, anything, but it's allowing uh, what has been suppressed, what has been denied, uh, one's feelings, emotions, reactions to life into consciousness. So that, and then one can be mindful what arises in the consciousness. So this is interesting to, to uh, contemplate how consciousness works, because the 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 Western model of consciousness was one of, of it being within the body, like the, you know, it was really associated very much with the brain. And, uh, and yet, uh, in the Vipassana practices, in, in the reflection on Four Noble Truths and Insights, is that you're actually, uh, by letting go, and letting go of conditions is, is not suppressing or denying or annihilating anything. It's just letting them be what they are. So, so learning to uh, accept, uh, let the mood, my rebellious mood or anger or resentments or jealousies or fears, when they would arise to let them be and, and be the awareness itself of these emotions and then you have the insight into their impermanence and their, their anatta or not self. So, and w when training uh, in a strict monastery, there's a lot of rules that I thought were s foolish or silly or unnecessary, uh, basically because I'm quite a lazy person at heart and I don't like fussiness and all the picayune kind of discipline and rules, and so I, you know, I, I find it, it annoying. I, I'm, you know, like the grand gestures of life, the great ideals, <clears throat> but I've always felt very annoyed, irritated at the kind of uh, detailed fussiness that, that some people seem to be obsessed with. Well, I had to deal with this, this, rea this feeling of being irritated frustrated and also I began to see the suffering. Uh, was it the rules, the, 
the, the little rules, the fussiness of the way you had to do it in a certain way, was that the cause of suffering or was my just not wanting to be bothered? Uh, my own conceit, thinking these are not necessary and that. So I began to, you know, investigate. And looking into the causes of suffering was not wanting, like not, not wanting all this fussiness around the rules. Uh, in, the, in the Thai monasteries, the, uh, you have in the rainy season a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, so I contemplated mosquitoes a lot because there were so many. And of course, in, uh, uh, you know, we, when you become a Buddhist monk, you can't kill anything with intention. So, uh, and then in the rainy season, there's this thing you're kind of, you're sitting in, in a meditation hall like this, and, and they didn't have screens or mosquito screens or any way of stopping them, so they, they'd come in and they, you could be, you know, have these, irritating bites and buzzing sounds and it would bring up so much anger and um, aversion and desire to 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 uh, get rid of them i could actually begin to see you know contemplating this desire to annihilate what i don't like just uh, just by contemplating the the reality of mosquitoes uh, because, you know, I didn't like them. They're not, you know, it's, they're not lovable. They never do become lovable. One never, after 40 years, likes mosquitoes. Uh, if they're just unlikable, uh, irritating creatures. But you don't believe that anymore. You don't follow that emotion because your relationship to them is is compassion rather than uh, just getting rid of what you don't like and what irritates you. Well, that to be able to do that was to have to expand my vision of of life, and this is what uh, Lung Po Cha offered an expanded expanded vision of consciousness, a kind of unlimited consciousness that was receptive, intelligent, and uh, in which one could actually begin to, to observe uh, the conditioning, the, the ego, how my ego, my sense of myself, how that operated. I began, began to observe it like it's an object rather than the subject. Like the unawakened human individual, the ego is how you operate. You, you, you interpret all experience through the sense of me and mine, myself. <clears throat> so when I, during those first years of training, of course I interpreted, uh, you know, I had to live with this ego, uh, conceited arrogance that comes from uh, uh, being born in the society that I'm from. Because like in the, in the, in the American sense, I'm, I'm from the kind of privileged group of, the, of Americans. And so you, you have a sense of, uh, you know, even though I never considered myself, you know, I didn't like the idea of, of snobbery or superciliousness, arrogance, and that I, I did have a basic assumption of somehow superiority that I had never really contemplated. And, and just through the awareness, through this surrender and awareness, through mindfulness, mindfulness awareness with consciousness, I began to see a lot of the cultural assumptions that I'd never noticed before. And as we know here at Amravati, with, because it's so international, uh, you know, if we are all from different places, uh, so we, we have cultural assumptions from, you know, whether you're from Japan or Thailand or Sri Lanka or Germany or whatever, we, you know, whether you like it or not, you've got a certain mindset, certain way of looking that comes from the cultural conditioning. And uh, how do we get beyond that is through this awareness. Because pure consciousness 
isn't isn't created by human beings. It's it's uh, dhamma. It's natural. It's not. It's not. It doesn't. It's not a cultural condition. So you can't claim consciousness as uh, American consciousness or Japanese consciousness. Consciousness is consciousness. Is a, in a male or a female. It's consciousness. It's not. It's not. There's female consciousness and a male consciousness. So in the, uh, or uh, Asian consciousness and a European consciousness. And yet that's very much how the, the ego works in this very dualistic way of thinking, you know, Asia and Europe and Buddhism, Mahayana, Hinayana, Theravada. Uh, we have, uh, then there's Hinduism and Christianity, Islam, Judaism, goes on like that. So we, we have these very cultural, like I was brought up as a Christian. So well, even though I kind of lost faith, and lost interest in it, I have a, a very Christian mindset, you know, culturally speaking. Very dualistic and uh, this is good, and this is bad and heaven, hell. And, and this, is, uh, this is, is the kind of assumptions that one makes from the religious and cultural conditioning I received. Now with uh, Lung Po Cha, because of the mindfulness, emphasis on mindfulness, one can get behind the, that kind of conditioning. The conceit uh, uh, of one's cultural conditioning or the, the sense of being better or inferior, superiority or inferiority or whatever. Because consciousness doesn't have any of that. It's not about inferiority or superiority. It's not about a higher consciousness either. Like we, we're, we, we're somehow at a lower level of consciousness and we have to attain a higher one. Because that is still a very dualistic way of perceiving it. So the, the uh, emphasis was on mindfulness, which, which is the simplicity of awakened presence here and now. It's not about higher. It's about here and now, where higher no longer is an issue, higher or lower. And in this consciousness, then the higher and lower, refined and coarse, can manifest, arise and cease according to other conditions. So this is the the training that I received from Lung Pon Cha was very much this emphasis on mindfulness. Well, I found it the first year where I, I couldn't really understand the teaching. Uh, you know, Lung Pon Cha was, was at his peak, really, at his best during those 10 years that I lived with him. Uh, and, um, he was brilliant, expounding Dhamma. But the first couple of years, I could hardly understand it, anything he said. You know, like, because of language. But in an intuitive sense, I kind of connected on that level. So I could bear with the frustration of not being able to understand uh, or the language. Or as I began to understand it, you know, I had to struggle and, and kind of, um, because I did tend to interpret Thai into English words. So, there's the first couple of years I really appreciate because, I mean, even though it might have seemed, uh, you know, looking back, I, I just feel incredibly grateful for that. Uh, for all the frustration and difficulties that I experienced. And at the time, I remember, it was, you know, what am I doing here? You know, this, uh, you know, I had the, the way the mind would, would find fault and, and uh, feel all kinds of, I would get strong sense of paranoia sometimes. When you're living in a, in a culture that's very different from your own, and they react differently, and then you don't know what's going on. 
And, uh, and so you get, I, I would start getting paranoid, start interpreting, misinterpreting all kinds of actions and reactions to things. But uh, Lumpur Chah's emphasis was on awareness, not on, you know, trying to figure it all out and, and, and to have, you know, before I could actually develop mindfulness and meditation, I'd have to learn to speak fluent Thai. It was, there was no, no suggestion of that, that I even had to learn Thai. Uh, it was about practice, and practice was always on a, its level of mindfulness. So we actually had to do a lot of work. Uh, Lung Po Chao was always great at finding work projects for us, which I didn't like because I wanted to practice, practice, and I like that of sitting and, and getting very tranquil because I, I can concentrate my mind, I can get very tranquil, and, and I quite like that. But then if you're working, like we had to do laboring work, building things and, and uh, building walls. I still today when I go to Wat Papo, we built this really ugly wall. Uh, which <laughs> still exists, but they build a, a better wall later because uh, uh, Wat Bap Pong tended to expand. But when I lived there, we, we built this very ugly wall, which I was very much part of building this, this ugly thing. <laughs> and uh, brick lane and rendering bricks and all this was something, you know, I've never, I'm very much a, person that, you know, likes to sit and read books, not, not do that kind of work. We helped build a road one time, uh, and it was just, you know, to, you know, on a hill in the uh, um, uh, province of Amnat to learn. So, I mean, this was, this was, uh, you know, and, and yet, when I look back, this was a very important part of the training, because brick laying or rendering bricks or building roads is not an obstruction to mindfulness. It might disrupt your, you know, your refined samadhi, but basically Lung Po Chao was always pointing at the here and now, so we actually had to learn how to live a monastic life, making up, we had to make our robes, dye them in the jackfruit dye. Everything was was kind of old and tedious. Every, there was no kind of instant uh, things available. Uh, there was no electricity in the monastery. Uh, it was all very quite primitive. Uh, no uh, uh, running water. We had to use wells and things like this. Lung Po Cha kept us always working on this very le low level of technology like drawing uh, water from wells and sweeping, we, uh, we had to keep the monastery very clean, so we swept paths, we had to make our own brooms out of branches, um, sew our own robes. We were allowed to use sewing machines, these treadle sewing machines, because we didn't have electricity, and then dye them in, the, in this jackfruit dye, which is quite, you know, takes a lot of time and patience to make. So, just the lifestyle, just the way of living, having to every morning go out on the alms round into villages uh, and the highly structured life we lived, I found, you know, I didn't, you know, I, the first year, I put up with it, you know, I kind of grin and bear it, grit my teeth and, and uh, but my ideal was to go off by myself and um, so I told Ajahn Chah I wanted to go off by myself to this uh, remote place where I could, where we didn't have to work all the time and where I didn't have to live with a lot of other monks. And of course he kept refusing me and then finally he, he said okay and uh, let me go. So I spent six months in a very beautiful place but uh, I also had six months of hell which was my mind, it was not, not due to the place. <laughs> and so I began to, you know, just figure it out. That, that when I operate on just what I want, 
I could see every time in my monastic life that I've tried to manipulate conditions for my own benefit. It seems to have this very kind of reaction. Uh, a, very, a lot of things go wrong, and uh, and in, even though I, you know, I've, I've, I've rationalizations justify my my own views, that just doing following my own desires, even if they're very good desires, where th things always seem to go wrongly, and. Uh, the reactions were were always very unpleasant. So uh, during that time, I began to just see the to just not not to try to to give up that to just live like step by step in the moment. And and even though one appreciates that as an ideal as a and as a concept, to actually do that is is not an easy thing to do. Because we are, uh, you know, especially here in in, uh, in, in uh, modern affluent societies, very much programmed for goals, reaching goals, and and duty, getting things done, and and uh, going places and whatnot. I feel very fortunate that I I did I was able to to live there for 10 years in the Isan because uh, now it's changed. Thailand's become a very modern country. Uh, those 10 years from 1967, 66 actually, to 1977, when I came to live here, uh, Thailand uh, became a very modern country. Uh, it was changing during those 10 years. But where I lived, it was still like old-fashioned Thailand or Laos. It, was, uh, it wasn't, you know, the roads weren't very good and the, everything was quite basic and like old rice-growing villages, farming communities we lived with, lived near always these farming, uh, rice farmer, rice farming villages. And I began, as I learned the language and understand the dialect, uh, I, I began to appreciate the, the kind of quality of life of these uh, Northeast Thai rice farming communities. A certain loveliness and graciousness uh, that uh, I found very appealing. Uh, so whenever I hear the Isan dialect or Lao, and it's kind of heartwarming feeling, is that particular sound of, of Northeast Thailand uh, has a particularly uh, heartwarming <coughs> uh, reaction in my, in my heart because it was those, those 10 years where I transformed from being, uh, you know, very uh, egotistical, uh, self-centered, individual towards uh, one who's actually uh, living uh, by letting go of that, freeing myself from the suffering of my ego, my, my thoughts, my memories, my emotions. So then the, uh, when I came to live here in the England, it was you know, quite a, you know, changing. I learned the basic, basics. The, I had the, you know, I never, I've never had trouble here in England. I've never doubted about the practice. I've had many doubts about many other things, but the actual practice uh, that I learned through those 10 years in, with Lung Pa Cha, uh, that, that was a kind of very, that was very clear. And so, then coming to live in, in here in this country, and of course the first two years we lived in London, living in a big city, uh, after living so many years in the, in the rural rice-growing areas, <laughs> uh, quite, 
quite interesting effect. But you could actually watch your, you know, the, the effects it had. I remember first uh, de getting used to the London Underground. It used to terrify me. And if you've been to like Belsize Park or Hampstead Underground Station, you have to go down very deep, you know, through stairways into these tunnels. And it just seemed so kind of, kind of frightening in a way. You know, crowds of people running about, r rushing here and there, entering, leaving trains. And it all seemed so complicated. And just g developing that as an awareness around the, the, a city life, a modern city, uh, living in a house. And um, we lived in, a, you know, north e northwest London in Hampstead, and that was quite a nice part of London to live in. But still, it was very different from what I was used to. But the emphasis has always been on the mindfulness rather than, you know, nostalgia for or, or you know, believing your own emotional reaction. During that first year, uh, I wanted to go back to Thailand. They had so many problems the first year at the Hampstead Vihara. Uh, and, and so I was, uh, you know, really didn't want to be in such a situation uh, where there was so much acrimony and uh, uh, and everybody was looking at me to solve all the problems. So, I, I, before Lung Po Cha left to return to Thailand in 1977, he came, we came together, but then he only stayed a short while and returned. <coughs> he made me promise I wouldn't go back to Thailand for five years. So, I make a promise, I'm a very loyal disciple, so I promised him and uh, and I, that was a very wise thing for him to do because I, I probably would have gone back the first year. And, but also I actually knew how to practice with that, with, uh, with the problems and difficulties, both internally in myself and the external problems that I was witnessing. And, uh, and after the first year, a lot of those problems seemed to go and the second year everything seemed to be required chitters and the whole kind of uh, sense of flourishing developed of, of uh, you know things everything seemed to go right and uh, and th during this time I remember in, in uh, living with Lung Po Cha in uh, at, at his monastery Wat Ba Pong I came at a time where there were very few monks. There were only 22 of us uh, monks in the monastery at the time. And uh, now there's, you know, enormous, very it's expanded enormously. But uh, and they were all very, we were all very devoted to Ajahn Chah. We were there, all of us, all of the monks were there for him. So we all looked to him as a, as our teacher. So there was no conflict on that level, like other monks uh, competing or that. We whatever Lung Po Chao said, we did that, and that made life very easy. Um, so he, you know, he could torture us. He used to uh, the, the food. Uh, you know, they have it. They eat uh, sticky rice, you know, which glutinous rice, which I quite like. But also, he'd mix all the food together. Not that you get the rice separate in the in the alms bowl, but then all the, like the lay people bring these tiffin carriers with nice little curries and whatnot, and he dump them all in one big basin, and you get chicken and pork and fish all mixed together in this kind of horrible mixture of of uh, different flavors. And then we ladle it out into the alms bowls of the monks. Well, that is a first. I found that just totally disgusting way to eat, and uh, but I learned to eat that way. <laughs> 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 uh, 
the first month I couldn't eat it. I ate just mangoes. I arrived during the mango season. Mangoes and sticky rice. But after that, when the mangoes stopped, then I had to learn to eat the rest. And, and I did. I began to just, you know, reflect on, uh, you know, the, the reaction, the aversion the, the, that I felt and wanting it to be otherwise. And this is what Lung Cha wanted us to do, to, to be able to observe, you know, how we don't, none of, a, no, none of the monks probably liked the food. Uh, it was made very unlikable, but we learned to eat that. And then there would be days where we would, uh, we'd be invited out, I remember, a big uh, wealthy woman in Ubon, in the city of Ubon, who had movie theaters. And uh, she was of Chinese ancestry. And when she invited us, then we knew we were in for a really good meal, Chinese food. <laughs> and uh, it was, I was ashamed to tell you how greedy it made me. <laughs> Even eating this, this kind of stuff. And then suddenly, you know, your face, you have given all this wonderful Chinese food and uh, that you can choose and that. I became, I mean, almost out of control. But <laughs> this is how you learn, you know, how, how you learn uh, about greed and aversion and so forth. Food is a very important part of it because like food does bring up the uh, greed and aversion in very obvious ways. <coughs> so everything uh, was used for this mindfulness practice because there were a lot of wonderful times and uh, also, you know, learning to, as I became more uh, understanding of the language, I learned to read the Thai uh, Lung Po Cha especially liked Buddhadasa's writings. So, so we always had, uh, Buddhadasa was one of the famous monks of that time, in, lived in southern Thailand. And so uh, he was, uh, a lot of his pamphlets and that, they have published these, these little booklets and pamphlets of his teaching. I learned to read Thai through reading Buddhadasa. And uh, Buddha taught, and and then, but Buddha taught was also teaching in this similar way of attention here and now, attention awareness. So the result is, uh, you know, the when when I think of Ajahn Chah, I always have this sense of of Gatanyu Gatawati, which is the uh, Gratitude, because uh, you know it was very. Uh, I feel uh, this uh, this feeling of incredible gratitude for uh, meeting him and for learning. He, he was he's quite he was a very uh, charming person. Had a great sense of humor. He was a very earthy person. He wasn't like floating up in the sky. The, you know, living with angels and devadas, but he was actually a very earthy, practical man. And he also understood the human pr condition. Like the, the thing I learned, and I really appreciate living in the uh, Thai monastery those years, was uh, there, it's a much more kind of, it's not idealistic. Like uh, in Northeast Thailand, it's they're because they're farmers and uh, mainly rice growing communities, they're, they're very much aware of the environment and the earth and the things around, the very kind of earth bound conditions. And being Buddhist, they also have, they're not living according to ideals of how they would like life to be. They have an acceptance of life, uh, both in its pleasurable and unpleasurable experiences. Uh, it's, they, they seem to know, like Lung Po Cha seemed to know that, that things change. You can't keep things at a peak and, 
and make everything, control everything to fit your ideal. And this was very important to me because one of my, when I first went there, of course, I kind of idealized the monastery. I thought, this is really, this is the perfect monastery. And then as I lived there for uh, three years, past four years, and then I began to see things I didn't like about it. Uh, <clears throat> there were, um, and so, you know, I began to become very critical and I began to notice, you know, it wasn't like it used to be. Uh, it's degenerating. And so I thought, I'd better warn Lung Po Cha, you know, the expert, me, going. <laughs> so I remember going to him and, and warning him and saying, you know, it's not like it used to be. Uh, this, I, this isn't like it used to be and that. And, and he just said, changing. And here I was trying to ignite him, you know, to get him to say, we've got we've to bring it back to what it was. And he was laughing at me. And he, he loved to say, oh, Sumato loves to suffer. And because, you know, it's such an idealistic person. Uh, so idealistic and high-minded. And, and I had visions of how, you know, I wanted Wat Mapong to be like this and stay in this, the way that I idealized it. And when I saw it changing, of course, uh, it doesn't change for the better, it changes for the worse. And so, and then I began to feel this, this, this kind of fear that it's all degenerating. Well, I, Lung Po Cha wouldn't, wouldn't go along with that. He's pointing to change rather than to an ideal, perfect peak monastery. And that, when I couldn't get aroused him, fear in Ajahn Cha or concern about the changing conditions uh, that, I, that, I, that I thought was degenerating, I s began to observe because he had a very powerful effect to get me to look at how I actually was feeling. And I could see this desire, you know, this kind of conceit that I, my ideal of what Wat Bapong was and what it should be, and that I didn't particularly like the way it was going at the present time. And, I, and everything was reflected in this um, consciousness. You know, I could see this. I want it to be like this. I don't want it to change like that. I don't. Uh, and so, I, just by observing this, the, how my personality would, and my critical mind would operate. <clears throat> I, and then Lung Po Cha's lack of concern about change. Uh, I was always pointing at change rather than at how things should be or how things were at a previous time. Later on, some of his, uh, as Wat Ba Pong became more modernized in electricity and um, they, the wells uh, were changed, we had pumps on the wells and we had, everything was made, was modernized there is a lot of criticism of that because the ideal was this very primitive uh, monastery. But I could see in myself that, that, that you can't hold things down to an ideal standard, that, uh, that, that life is about change and uh, things change uh, for the better and then they change for the worse. They don't keep changing for the better and it get better and better. They get better and then they get worse. And, and then, then so our, and the, apply that to your own state of mind, you know, to the fears, anxieties, uh, uh, your emotional habits and views and opinions and physical uh, condition. Like now, uh, you know, I'm uh, be 75 next month, three, three quarters of a century, uh, 75, does have this perception of being very old, even when you're 75. You know, I don't feel old, but the perception of 75, because I acquired the perception of 75 as old age when I was a child. 
In fact, 60 was old age, or 40, even 30. But as you get older, the, old, the aging process, you, uh, 50 used to seem old, now 50 seems young. 60, I think, near child, 60, 70, uh, old. And I can't really, really say young anymore, or people keep saying, you're still young, and, I, and I'm not. I mean, I don't want to be young. I, you know, in terms of this path, this is the, this is what I learned from, from old age and the changes that come through the body. The aging process is, a, is to learn, is not to identify. We, we resent getting old from the ego level, you know. I, I always want to, I want people to tell me how young I am. And uh, because my ego uh, is, is conditioned to see myself as, as, you know, like when you say you're old, it's kind of insulting in the Western, Western context. <coughs> but for me, if, uh, you know, you see it in terms of Dhamma rather than in terms of vanity or attachment to the body. As if I'm this body, uh, then, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely old, an old body, and it feels old. Yet in, in mentally, I don't feel old. It's kind of ages, because consciousness has no age. And so this is where we, we begin in, say, with meditation, is to begin to recognize, awaken to pure consciousness. And this is why we call it the deathless. And uh, you know, I was on the retreat, giving a retreat in Portugal last week, and I kept emphasizing this over and over, the deathlessness, because this is a word that you can't imagine. You know, you can't make an image out of deathlessness. Um, and the word death itself is a, it has an ominous ring, doesn't it? You know, in, in polite circles, it's not really uh, you know, not a subject that you talk about at the dinner table. You, you know, it's not very nice death in, in say, in Western so, uh, social circles. And old age, you don't, you know, you, you talk about babies and, and the beautiful things of life, being politically correct, being nice, and not mentioning that somebody's old or uh, that somebody passed, uh, passed away. They put it in a little less stark terms than somebody we knew is dead, because that's, that has a kind of finality to it. And the deathless, then, what is that? This is what beca beca is apparent through mindfulness. Uh, this is a, 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 an insight into the deathless, it's a reality. It's not. It's not a imagined or refined state. It's so simple, so real. We we bypass it. We miss it all the time because uh, on the condition level, we're so bound up in our own thoughts, memories, emotional habits, identity with the body that we. You know, it's hard to. You know, that's our world, how we create the world around us. It's through the conditioning. Always defining and judging, criticizing, uh, and picking and choosing among the conditions. Where the unconditioned or the deathless is with us all the time, but we, don't, we forget or we don't notice. So what mindfulness is, it, it's that gate, that door, that that which is open to us in the present moment all the time when we recognize it. And so the, the aim of this monastery, Amravati, is to recognize the deathless. You know, that's the name of the, what Amravati means, deathless realm. Well, it's not, I'm not trying to point to the place, but it's a reminder of, of what we're here for, is this, awakened attentiveness till we 
we know with it's a it's a this what they call jnana dasana. It's a profound knowing, a direct knowing, not from concepts anymore or ideas, but we know this pure knowing consciousness with mindfulness and wisdom, and then that, that is the liberation that the Buddha was pointing to. And this is very much what Lung Po Cha, uh, his whole, the essence of his teaching was about, and the, and the life that we lived in, in this monastery was, its sole purpose was for this, this awakened, conscious, consciousness with mindfulness and wisdom. Now all all of all all beings are conscious, but not mindful or wise. So, <laughs> so consciousness isn't something you lack, is it? It's something you you always you know, we're conditioned to create into our consciousness, ourselves, our views and opinions, our fears, our desires and so forth. When we see the, the suffering we create by doing that, then we let go. And then that is the, the path, the way of non-suffering. And this is, when they say, budgetang weti dapo, we need to be realized individually. It's nothing that somebody else can do for you. So on this auspicious day, uh, 17 June, uh, Maybe we'll chant the, uh, this gratitude, the Amina chant, uh, for the, you know sharing the the blessings of our lives with all the teachers and parents and that. This is one of the finest, most kind of <coughs> generous chants that a human being can possibly think up. So I'll stop here.